ha, ha, ha. Man, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Man, hope y'all are doing well. Jeremy Anderson here. Excited for tonight's next level talks. I'm tonight. I'm talking that talk. I promise you. I'm talking that talk, and I promise you, I'm doing my best to walk that walk, man. I um I'm excited for tonight. Tonight I'm gonna talk to you all about a recent engagement I had. I'm gonna let you in behind the scenes so you can actually see what I did wrong, what I did right, you know what I'm saying? Like how I made necessary pivots and adjustments. Like tonight I'm gonna let you all into a bit more of my world and then my thought process. If I had to give this next level talks a title, I would probably call it something like all speaking is ministry, right? Even when I'm doing corporate events, I'm seeing God move and do something different. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. But I really wanted to have a moment where I can be open and vulnerable and really let you all into my world so you can see what it looks like day to day as a speaker, man. So I'm excited for tonight. I'm excited for what I'm about to share with you all. You know, if you're excited and you tapped in with me live right now, man, just talk to me in the chat. Just put excited in the chat. Put the hundred emojis in the chat. Put the fire symbol in the chat. You know, make sure you share this with somebody and make sure you like it. If you like it, if you've been on our previous Next Level Talks, the first one and the second one we had last week and you were on for the second or third time, um, just put on back in the chat. Come on to talk to me. I see all the comments. I see all the comments. So I want to know who's really feeling it, who's really tapped in. And um, I'm excited for tonight. So a lot I'm going to share with you again. I'm going to give you play by play of what to do at speaking engagements, what not to do, how to maximize the most for those opportunities and always keeping a posture, reminding yourself that this is all ministry. Next Level Talks. Let's get it. You go out here and you clean your seat. Oh, oh, I just touched down. Now it's time to celebrate. celebrate. Super Bowl in Vegas, this where the big step is played. Yeah, yeah. My whole squad will paint the town, but they don't decorate. Yeah. And my work a bit excessive, check my resume. Keep it a C no. If I'm speaking, I'm the Kino. Super Bowl in Vegas, this where the big steppers play. My whole squad will paint the town, but they don't decorate. And my work a bit excessive. Check my resume. Ooh, yeah, ooh, yeah, ooh, yeah, ooh, yeah. Ooh, yeah. Oh, man, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. I'm excited. So, uh, first off, I want to shout out. All the people that's in the academy, if you're in the Next Level Speakers Academy, just put academy, just put academy in the chat. Let me know if you're here, man. If you are a part of the Next Level Speakers Academy, you are part of our growing community, man. Tap in with me in the chat. Let me know that you're here. Team, were they there? How are we doing? Okay, they tapped in. All right, now let me know what city y'all from. Let me know what city y'all And Stevon, Jerry, y'all say what's up to the people, man. What's up, family? Yeah. What's happening? You know what I'm saying? All right, let's see. Let's see. Where are we coming in? What city? What city and what country? We got Tennessee in the building. We Come got on. NYC in the building. We got Charlotte in the building. Memphis, San Bernardino, New York, yeah. Birmingham. Man, they all tapping in all across the country. I man. love it. I love it, man. I appreciate y'all tapped in with me tonight. I've got a lot to share in a small amount of time. And, you know, as always, I'll take, I'll take your questions on the back end. But let's get started, right? Um, and again, if you all can subscribe, if you haven't already subscribed, if you're watching, you know what I'm saying, this replay, you're watching it fresh, like definitely click subscribe, tap in with us. We want to make sure that you catch all the notifications whenever we drop new content, new videos. We want to make sure it comes to you. I'm not selling nothing. I'm not pitching nothing. At the end of the day, I just want to add value to your life and put you in the best position to win. At the end of the day, I just want you to win. I want you to have life. And as the word of God says, life more abundantly. I want you to win in every single aspect of life. So on Next Level Talks, we're not just talking about like what to do. We're talking about who to be. Last week, we talked about knowing, doing, being, like really being that person, right? And that's something I'm constantly striving on, constantly making adjustments and tweaks on a regular basis, right? And tonight, I'm going to let you all into my world so you see a bit more of like what happens, what goes on when you're looking at building relationships and really maximizing these speaking engagements. So with that being said, you've liked it by now, you've commented, you let me know how you're feeling, you in the chat. Let's get right to it, right? First off, I had a speaking engagement. It was right here in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, I was speaking for uh, a department with the county. I won't put all their business out there, but this particular group of individuals and social workers work with women, work with families, 
and work with children. And so when the opportunity came to me to serve, let's start right there. Not when the opportunity came to me to speak. There's a difference, Devon. You know what I'm saying? When the opportunity came to me to serve, I was just like, man, I'd be honored. I'd be humbled to come in and add value to speak and to serve this organization. So went across town and um, I, I, I'm at a place in my brand now, just full transparency, where I'm mindful of the things I get filmed, the footage, the B-roll, right? I've been on some massive stages with the lights and the smoke and the flames and the fire and the 20 foot tall screens. Like I done, I done seen it all, right? And so at this point here, I'm only getting certain things filmed. I don't get every single thing filmed and recorded because I'm always looking at my at my brand. And so Ebony, my assistant and booking manager, she handles all that stuff. When I got pictures of the venue, I was like, okay, this is kind of like a small, like conference center style room that seats maybe 200 people. This ain't like nothing crazy. They ain't got like crazy tech and stuff like that. I was like, okay, bet. That's all I need to know. And so I was like, I'm, I'm not going to worry about trying to get it filmed and doing all that production stuff. I'm just going to come in and add value and bless them. Now, even though I did not get it filmed, because I was just like, this footage is not going to help my brand later. I just got a brand new speaker reel created. For those of you all that's interested um, in, in having a speaker reel done, tap in with Next Level Brand Studios. Next Level Brand Studios. They just did my speaker reel. It's phenomenal. If I must say so myself, you know, what do you think, Stavai? It's hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, so, so, so for those of you all that's like, like, okay, let me see what it looks like. I want you all to check out that speaker reel. And I'll probably do a next level talks in the future about that. But I didn't get it filmed. But just because I didn't get it filmed doesn't mean that I didn't add value. Like I still poured into the people. Like, hear me and hear me clearly. I poured in. I stood before those people and went into straight ministry mode. And what's interesting is there are about four people um, that came with me on this event. So we have our Next Level Speakers Elite Program. And so that's where members that's in our elite community, they tap in with me and they get to shadow me and ET on a few of our speaking engagements per year, right? So we had four uh, of our elite members come in with us and they kicked it. They, they was with me at the gig. They was backstage. They was in the green room with me where they had the fruit, the spread, the donuts and all of that. And then they were sitting right front row. And so one thing that they realized, it was like, yo, Jay, even though this wasn't a massive crowd, because I mean, the, one of the biggest crowds I've spoken in that our community has been with me was in like 15,000 people. So they was like, this wasn't crazy like that. It was a couple hundred people, but you still like poured into them and gave them your all. Why? Because all speaking is ministry, right? All, come on, put a hundred in the chat if you feel me. If you feel what I'm saying, talk to me in the chat. All speaking, hear me clearly, all speaking, all speaking is ministry. You know what I'm saying? The word of God says that life and death is in the power of the tongue. So with that power that you have in your mouth, your tongue to speak, you can make people feel sad, down, discouraged, depressed, but you can also make them feel optimistic, excited, pumped up, invigorated. Are they putting hundreds in the chat? Yes, okay, I want to make sure y'all tapped in, right? Like, like, hear me and hear me clearly. All speaking is ministry if you're, in, if you're speaking in a positive way. Let me say that. So I went in and I gave them my all, y'all. And four things I do before every speaking engagement. Now, those of y'all that's interested in speaking, those of y'all that are currently speaking, or you're in our Speakers Academy, or you're just kind of interested, like, write these four things down. The first thing I do is I get the data. I want to know about the people in the room, where they from, you know what I'm saying? If it's a company, what's the average salary? How long have they been with the company for? I want to know what are some of your pain points? What are some of your challenges? What are the demographics, male, female? How long have they been with the organization for? Like, I want to know, I want to gather as much data. I want to know as much about the body of people that's in front of me as possible so I can really connect with them. Y'all put connect in the chat. Come on, talk to me. Those of y'all that's right here with me live, put connect in the chat. For those of y'all that's just like, man, Jay, I hear you, but there's no but. You want to make the best connection with them. So you got to get as much information as possible so you can connect in the best way. And so I, I get all the data. I want to, if I'm speaking to a group of teachers, I want to know, okay, what's the demographic of the teachers? Black, white, Hispanic? Like, I want to know, right? Male, female, I want to know, right? Like, are the students primarily African-American, but the teachers primarily Caucasian? Like, I want to know all those details and data 
so I can add maximum value. Now, so get the data. The next thing you got to do is you got to find out what's the agenda, what's the purpose, what's the theme of the event. Man, don't walk up in there thinking you're going to wax deep, thinking you're going to share your message, you're going to speak and share your story. Like, find out what's the theme, what's the purpose for this event. You want to get all the information so you can add maximum value to them, right? And then you want to say, okay, what do you want me to cover? I understand about the people that's in the audience. I understand the purpose now for this event. But what is it that you want me to cover? What is it that you want me to go over? What is it that you want me to talk about? Like, how do you want them to feel? What kind of response do you want them to have? You know what I'm saying? Like, what kind of connection? Like, how do you want them to walk? What are the takeaways they should walk away? So when I met with this organization, they were like, Jeremy, they're a bunch of social workers. And Jeremy, they tired. Jeremy, they discouraged. Jeremy, they woe out. But Jeremy, we want them to feel appreciated. Jeremy, we want them to feel valued. Jeremy, we want them to feel seen. And Jeremy, we want them to be reminded, watch this, reminded why they do what they do. So I'm like, man, I'm honored to be able to speak on behalf of the state to a whole bunch of social workers that's out here saving lives and advocating for these women, children, and babies, right? And so I did my thing. And the last thing I did right before I took the stage is I was prayerful. I took a moment, I found me a little corner, and I was just like, man, God, you blessed me with this opportunity. I said, God, you know exactly who's in this room, separate from what the directors have given me. You know what they're struggling with. You know what they're going through. You know what they're fighting. You, you know all the challenges. You know everything that they have going on, God. Give me the words. Help me like a surgeon to be like systematic, methodical, very calculated with what I share so that it can connect with each person in its individual way. So I be praying that the spirit guides me. When you do those four things, you will give a phenomenal speech. I don't care how good of a communicator you think you are, or you are, I don't care how dynamic and powerful your story is. I know some people who got some powerful dynamic stories and when they take the stage and speak, it's poo poo. It ain't that deep. You know why? Because they didn't gather the data. They don't really understand who's in the audience. Or two, they don't understand what the agenda is or what's the purpose or what's the theme for the event. They didn't have a full understanding. Or three, they wasn't fully sure, okay, the people who booked me and paid me, it's a, spe a specific message they want me to come across. So they didn't get the information. Or they might have got all of that but wasn't prayerful. They might have got the data. They might have found out about the people that's in the audience and got some understanding. I know what the purpose for the event is. I know all of that. And I know what y'all want me to cover. But they went in their own strength. They went in their own, some people went in their own strength. They was just like, you know what? I got this. I'm charismatic. I got a great personality. I got the gift of gab. I'm great at communicating. I'm about to just go into this thing and do my thing. And they never once went to God and was just like, man, God, guide my words, guide my thoughts. Does that make sense? Y'all put make sense in the chat. Talk to me. Put make sense in the chat. But those of you that say, man, I'm going to be prayerful, like, okay, God, what do you want me to share? What is the message you want to come across? Game changer. And so I did that, and I began to really connect with the people, right? Are they put? Are that? Are they putting make sense? Is they making yes, sense? Sir. To them? Yes, sir. It's making sense to all of them. Okay. All right. Good. I want to make sure we are we are crystal clear there. Now, making the connection, making the connection. This is very important, right? So, because I was a social worker in college, that's what I studied. That was the very first story I told. That was the big, y'all want to hear how I told the story? Y'all want to hear how I broke it down? Let me know in the chat if y'all want to hear. If you want me to skip over it, I'll go to some more things I want to talk about. If you want me to know, like, how I flow, what they say, Estevan, they want to know? Oh, yeah, they want to know. They saying, yes, break it down. Give okay. us all the game. Okay, all right, all right, all right, all right. Since you twisted my arm. <laughs> you know what I'm yeah. saying? So, look, y'all, I stood in front of them, and I was like, man, to all my fellow social workers, man, I got so much love and respect for y'all. I said, y'all saw that crazy you know what I'm saying? Uh, speaker video that my team put together. They got me looking larger than life. Y'all, I ain't that deep. I'm a social worker just like you at heart. But I'm not just a social worker at heart. I got a degree in social work. And I could feel the tension in the room decrease. Because in their job, in their position, a lot of them, so half of them was fanned out. Like, oh, my God, Jeremy here, which is always weird to me, right, to hear that. Because I'm just like, man, I'm not that deep. But then some people was kind of like robbing the social work for the last 30 years, baby, since she was wiping your nose. It's not like, what you got to tell me? So when I let them know, I'm a fellow social worker. And I was like, matter of fact, let me tell y'all, when I started in college, this is what I told them. I said, I initially majored in girls and communication. And they, <laughs> said, I said, I try to keep it one thou while. You know what I'm saying? I try to keep it a buck. I'm like, I majored in la the ladies. I was a little bit of a fart. Paquito. Mucho. All right. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm like, I majored in the ladies and communications, right? And so I realized by my second year, 
it was like communication was like mass media, television, radio production. That's not really what I was on. I wanted to effectively communicate and speak to change lives. And I was in a library one day and my homeboy, Corey, who we call C-Bone, OG, triple OG. He was a graduating senior and I'm, I'm like a sophomore now. And they in the library and I don't know if I was studying or if I was kicking it with one of my little babes that was studying, but I was in the library, praise God, right? And I remember I heard a whole bunch of ruckus. You know how in the libraries and colleges, universities, you can rent out private rooms? Well, I heard a whole bunch of ruckus and, and excitement and laughter. I thought it was like a frat party. So Corey come out, I'm like, bro, what up, bro? He was just like, hey, what's up, man? I'm like, bro, what's going on in there? He was like, oh, man, we, 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 we getting ready for exams or something like that. I'm like, bro, that's like a frat party or something? He's like, nah, bro, we social workers, and we about to change the world. And at that moment, I felt something shift in my heart. I wasn't even really sure what social workers did. I just knew I wanted to change the world. I just knew I wanted to be amongst people like you that was out here saving lives and changing the world. Can, can y'all feel me? On, let me tell you something. They was like, hey, man, baby, we changed the I won them over by telling a story, which was real. I won them over. All of them was like, let's go. We changed I was just like, and I, so, I, said, I told them, I wasn't even sure what all it entailed. I said, but their enthusiasm. Never lose your enthusiasm for advocating. Never, never lose your passion for saving lives. Never lose your enthusiasm for advocating for these children, these babies, these families. Man, they was, they was, this is my first seven minutes in, into my presentation that I had them all the way locked in. And from there, now they know, okay, this social worker, the social worker. This not motivational speaker, the social worker. Does that make sense? Tell me in the chat if this makes sense. Put 100 in the chat if that makes sense. This is, and then share this with somebody and like it. Because you know what happens when you like it? When you like it, YouTube realizes, oh, this ain't trash. So I'm going to share this with the other people that have subscribed. So it was really important. So shout out to those of you. Y'all put a heart in the chat if you if you liked it. Let me know in the chat if you liked it. Now, so I'm thinking like, okay, this is different. I'm, I'm locked in with them. I'm making the connection. And now we're building. And I'm, I'm talking to them, and I'm sharing my story, and I'm sharing my journey, and I'm letting them know how, how pivotal their roles are as social workers. And where it's, it is going so great. And so I knew that I wanted to have a balance of affirming them and supporting them and loving on them and making sure they feel seen, but I also wanted to challenge them. Like, let me be clear. I feel like I done read plenty of books uh, like Christian books, like Max Lucado, when I read his books, it make me feel like, it make me feel so good. But when I read a book, you know what I'm saying, by John MacArthur, I feel like a wretch. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it make me go deeper. And when I read a book, you know what I'm saying, by Rick Warren, I feel good. I feel like, yes, on this Christian journey. You know what I'm saying? But when I hear from other uh, writers, I feel more convicted. You know what I'm saying? Like Francis Chan, one of my favorite authors and pastors, right? And preachers. When I hear from Francis Chan, I feel convicted. So I told the people, I said, look, I'm going to love on y'all. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to uplift you. I'm going to have you ready to run through a brick wall. I said, but I do want to challenge you. Is that okay? They was like, yeah. And I was like, because if I challenge you and you are more efficient and effective at your job, you're going to be able to be there to save that many more families, that many more babies, that many more kids. They actually need the best version of you. So they was open. And so I was like, okay, how can I, God, like right there on the spot, I was like, okay, God, I need to draw from a story. I need to draw from an example that can really pierce their hearts. Because sometimes in this social work space, what I know is you can get burned out easily. You can get tired easily. You can get depressed, uh, depressed and discouraged easily. Like you can get to a point where you feel like, you know what, I'm not even sure if this is really what I wanted to do, I don't really know if I'm making a difference because oftentimes it's almost like you're fighting against the system. You see things wrong with the system, but it's just like, hey, rules are rules. You're not here to change the system or book the system. You do the best you can to work within the system. So because I know that and I know that this position, I knew I had to share another story. If y'all want to know, just say, tell me, just say, tell the story, Jay, in the chat if you want to know. And Stevon, you let me know if it's overwhelmingly they saying to tell the story and not tell the story. But I knew I had to come with something different to really connect with them, to really paint the picture. Because I was just like, you know, you all are looking at these families and it's like all these families, you you got you you got implicit biases. You don't realize what they saying, Stevon. They say, tell the story, okay, all right, Jay. All right, bet. So they, they, I'm like, y'all got implicit biases. You all are burnt out. You feel like one family is the same as the next family, the same as the next family. And sometimes you forget that these are individual souls. 
I said, that's human behavior. It's okay. I said, sometimes you forget that these are individuals who are hurting on the inside. And they need a fresh you, a fresh perspective, not a burnt out you. And so I told them about this program I started in Atlanta. And, uh, and I'll, I'm going to give it to you exactly how I gave it to them. So I told them that when I first moved to Atlanta, I got invited to speak for this event um, that the city officials was hosting. And the, the bunch of important people was there. And um, um, governors and a whole bunch of important people like within the governor's office, the mayor's office, and the sheriffs and city council members, a lot of a community people were there and I spoke. And I remember meeting a woman named um, Captain Terry Glanton. Now she was over the Fulton County Jail. And now I'm speaking to a bunch of social workers in Fulton County, so they're really connecting. And some of them was like, yeah, I know Captain Terry. So I was like, Terry came to me, Captain Glanton, and said, Jeremy, your presentation was amazing. I need to figure out, like, how can I get you to come and speak to my young boys locked up? So I said, man, that's simple. All you got to do is give me a call. Call me, you know what I'm saying? And I'm going to pull up on you. And then and she was like, I'm going to hold you to that. I said, do it. So she hits me a few weeks later. It was like, Jeremy, can you come to the Fulton County Jail and speak to our young boys? I said, absolutely. So I get there. So she was just like, okay, Jeremy. So we've got two pods of 17-year-olds. I said, time out. I said, this is a jail. This is not like a detention center. She was like, yeah. She was like, baby, in Atlanta, we don't wait till you turn 18 to put you up in the big jail because the detention centers are filled up. And some of these crimes these 17-year-olds are doing, they on their way to prison. So she was just like, we have separate pods for them, cells, but in a separate place from the 18 and up. I said, wow. So I get there, and they they buzz me through. We got to go through like eight different security gates, and the armed security is there. The correctional officers walk me in, and they hit a button, and all of the jails opened up on the first and top floor, and about 60 young men came out. And um, and they, they got them quiet for just a minute, and I began to speak. And, I, y'all, I spoke for an hour and a half. Now, again, you know, I ain't mentioned nothing about no contract. I ain't mentioned nothing about no free this is just something God put on my heart. And I poured my heart out to them people. And after an hour and a half, man, some of the young brothers was crying. I prayed over them. It was powerful. It was a move of God, right? Somebody put praise God in the chat. You know what I'm saying? It was a move of God. And so when we left, check this out. When we left, Captain Glanton was like, Jeremy, that was amazing. I'm like, oh, praise God. She was like, no, you don't get it. Like, no fight broke out. Nobody got stabbed. I said, whoa, what? That be, <laughs> that be happening? Like, what are we talking about? And so she was like, yeah. She was like, you know, these guys are on a 23 and 1. I said, what's a 23 and 1? She said, 23 hours a day, they locked up, and they get out one hour a day. I said, well, why would y'all do that? Well, when they get out, they fight, and they're so volatile. they pent up aggression and anger and rage and testosterone is peaking. I'm like, yeah, because they're 17-year-olds, and you got them locked up for 23 hours a day. And then they're able to talk to each other, and they they talking about they set, they gangs, what's going to happen when they get out? So she was just like, long story short, Jay, I'm just grateful that you came, and I can't believe how quiet they sat for an hour and a half. You're welcome anytime. And so I, I put together a program, and I begin to show up on a regular basis, once a week, drive 45 minutes across town, because uh, I, I lived in Gwinnett County and then Dunwoody at the time, drove across town, and I would bring books every single week. I would buy books. I would bring Bibles. Then I got favored with the jail where I had my own badge at the Fulton County Jail, my name, my picture, my little number on there. I didn't have to have security with me, no correctional officers. They walked me in. Hey, Jeremy, they buzzed me all the way in. I'm in that sucker solo dolo, no videographer, no armor bearer, no team member, no homie, just me and the 60 inmates and the Holy Ghost. Somebody put, don't forget the Holy Ghost in the chat. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't take that lightly. Like, somebody, come on. I need 18 of y'all to put, don't forget the Holy Ghost in the chat. Because when I tell y'all in this jail, it goes down. Are they putting, don't forget the Holy Ghost in the chat? Yes, sir. Okay, all right, all right. So, look. So, I, I'm, I'm there. I'm doing my thing. I'm bringing books. I'm bringing Bibles. Then I got so much favor, y'all. They start letting me bring food. I'm bringing donuts up in there. Oh, uh, let me tell you something. I'm like, uh... I'm like uh, Frank Lucas at doing uh, don't give away turkeys, you know what I'm saying? In the hood, like I'm bringing donuts to them, and they just like, bro. So I'm just trying to do whatever I can do to love on them and let them know they feel seen. And y'all know the most beautiful thing: these guys will be trading books like they trading playing cards. These young, hardened criminals who the world deems as monsters and grooms on demon time, like they view them like that. 
But I'm seeing these guys said, nah, bro, uh uh, you can't get power, you can't get power plays without self destruction. Like, you need you need both these books. But boy, I'm seeing guys like, hey, bro, this book here, I read this fire, it's 425 pages. You trying to give me that book that's 128. I need two for this one. Like, they in there negotiating books and who gonna read what next and which books hold more value than others. Come on, y'all. I'm thinking, like, yo, this is beautiful. But then something happened and my life changed forever. I'm probably a year into the program, and I'm there how I always was, and I'm tired. Um, I just got back from speaking in Australia. I was in Melbourne, Australia, speaking for a huge conference. And for those of y'all that ever been to Australia, you know this to be true. For those of y'all that haven't, let me educate you. You actually lose a day. There is a thing called time travel. And so, Stevon and Jerry, do y'all remember our first trip to Australia? Oh, yeah. How, how, how was that? Without question. It was like 15, 16 hour flight. Man. Crazy. And it's like we left on Monday and got back on Wednesday. Yep. And we was like, where Tuesday went? Listen to me, y'all. I was struggling. Yeah. Some of y'all is like, yo, them, them boys went to Australia. Like, yeah, stop playing. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Them boys getting a passport stamp. So look, y'all, I'm, I'm literally in, I'm, I just got back, left it on Monday, got back on Wednesday, never saw Tuesday. And, and my body was tired. I was fatigued. I was burnt out, uh, jet lag. And I'm sitting here still pouring into him. And I see one young guy, he about 6'5", easily 280 pounds. He stand, I'm talking about big boy, cornbread fed. He stands up and pounds his hand on the table and just lets out a scream like, ah. And I'm thinking like, use your words. <laughs> I use the words, and my man is just like huffing and puffing, and I'm like, bro, talk to me. And he's like, man, Mr. Jeremy. I'm like, all right, at least he said Mr., so it's a little respect here, because I'm thinking like it's about to pop off. All this favor I got, ain't no correctional officers here, and my brain moving so fast, I'm like, something, if something does pop off and my man starts to feel spicy, I'm like, I know the other inmates, you know what I'm saying, got my back. Like, But I'm literally processing this because my man looks pissed, and I'm like, yo, bro, what's up? He was like, man, we need more from you. I'm thinking like, you need more from me? He's like, yeah, bro, we need more from you. So this is what I was thinking. I didn't say this, but my thoughts was, bro, you need more from me. Like, what you saying? Ain't nobody else showing up. You want a 23 and one. I come and spend a couple hours with you bringing books, bringing donuts, bringing Bibles, driving 45 minutes across town, like dealing with traffic, like to come all the successful attorneys. All the successful entrepreneurs, all the successful ball players and rappers that come to the city, ain't nobody else showing up for you. But you tell me you need more from me. I'm doing all this pro bono. And he so but that's what I was thinking, because I was in the flesh. If I can be honest, I was in the flesh. I'm thinking like I, cause one thing about me, one of my biggest pet peeves, if I don't feel appreciated, like I still struggle with that. You know what I'm saying? Cause I, I've had people take advantage of my kindness and my love in the past. So I was really struggling, like, bro, what you mean? And so I didn't say that. That's what I was thinking. So I asked him, I said, okay, young brother, so you need more from me? So tell me what you want. And my man, again, 6'4", 240 pounds, big boy, tats on his neck, got a few tats on his face. Like he fully committed to this lifestyle with tears in his eyes. My man said, bro, you come here, you bring us books, you bring us Bibles. We talk about the readings, but you tell us at nighttime, you go home and you be reading to your kids and you be praying with your kids. He said, bro, how come you ain't never read to us? <laughs> My man was like, bro, how come you ain't never read to us? Bro, you say you love us. You be praying for us. How come you ain't never read to us, bro? My man asking for story time, y'all. My man literally was just like, yo, my man said, we ain't had no father read to us. He was like, bro, most of us ain't here ain't had no father read to us. He was like, thank you for bringing the books. He's like, thank you for bringing the Bibles. You be pre you talk to us like you get helping us strategize what we going to do when we get out. But how come you don't never read to us the way you read to your kids, but you say you love us? Man, I shared that message on social workers. They was in there boo-hooing. You hear me? Y'all tell me how that, that story even made you feel in the chat. Just tell me real quick. I want to hear from I want to hear from some of y'all that heard this story fresh live from the first time. I want to know you hearing that my man tattoos in his face. He ain't asking for nothing but read to me. I look at you like a father figure, and he low key jealous of the experience my kids get. 
What they saying, Stevon? They're saying it's powerful. The story is deep. We got somebody dropping with the crying emojis. The story is too real. Somebody said, I need to read more to the kids in my classroom. Come on. They're feeling a the connection. Man. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, and I'm going to be honest with y'all, man. I'm not that geek. I would have never even thought that. I would have never been like, all right, today we're going to read this in this book. You know what I'm saying? But hearing it, I felt convicted. Y'all know I'm on that next level. So I'm always, so I knew my next level was to read to them. Man, let me tell y'all what I did. I grabbed that book so quick and gave them my best as darkness began to fall. <laughs> I changed my voice. Come on, y'all talk to me. I changed my voice as darkness began to fall. How Rakim said, how could this? I changed, I'm, I'm getting dramatic with it. I'm doing everything, but I'm, the thunder, the lightning, I'm giving them the best that I got. You feel me? Because I really wanted them to feel the love. And y'all laughing, but I'm serious. Y'all know I've been diagnosed, right? I've been diagnosed with doing the most. You know what I'm saying? And so I shared that experience with the social workers. And they cried. But then when I did the reading part, as darkness began to fall, they bust out laughing. I'll have to teach y'all later on crowd control. I have to teach y'all later on the, the art of storytelling and being mindful of the emotions that are naturally going to come but you want to kind of control it because they can slip in a deep, dark, depressed state and feel bad, but you ain't supposed to leave them there, okay? And so I share all that with y'all to say, man, it was such a phenomenal experience. I was able to be open. I was able to be vulnerable. I was able to be transparent with them to really let them know, like, what's going on in my world, the things I'm trying to figure out, the things I'm trying to do, the things I'm trying to accomplish. Like, it was it was truly something special. And um, and the response was amazing. You know, afterwards, it probably took about an hour for me to get out of there. It took almost an hour for me to get out of there because I'm because because people was just like kept coming to me like, man, I needed to hear that. Thank you so much. Life changing. I was on the verge of quitting. All the classic stuff I hear on a regular basis. And it's so humbling to hear. Uh, but the most coolest thing I can tell you is as I was getting ready to leave, there was one lady that came to me and uh, she introduced herself and she was the director's director's boss and she worked directly for the governor here in the state of Georgia. And she was like, Jeremy, that was the most powerful, heartfelt presentation I've ever heard. She was like, I'm going to be spreading your word, your name. Um, I don't, what they call it, the Capitol? They got state capitals, yeah. right? Yeah, she was like, at the Capitol. I didn't want to make some up. She was like, at the, I'm going to be spreading your name around the Capitol. I was like, praise God. You know what I'm saying? But I share all that with you to let you know that somebody else would have looked at this gig like, man, they, you know what I'm saying? They not really, they ain't got no budget or it's with the state, it's in a small little room, it's only 200 people, they only so, bump that, bump that. I'm like, man, God, you call me to do this work. You call me to do this work, so I'm gonna do everything I can to add maximum value, to pour into them, to uplift them, and to minister to them. I hope that makes sense to you. And I share that with you because oftentimes when it comes to speaking, we oftentimes feel like, almost like it's, a, it's, a, it's our right but it's really a blessing. You know what I'm saying? This isn't an occupation. Um, this isn't just a career. Like I believe professional speaking is a calling. Somebody put calling in the chat. If you feel that, if you agree with me, if you agree with me, just put calling in the chat, right? If, if you're watching the replay, let me know you tapped in and just put calling in the chat, right? If you realize professional speaking, it's not just a career. Um, it's not just an occupation. This is a calling. You gotta be called to do this work. Right. And you know what they often say. God don't call the qualify. He qualifies the call. Moses had a dog with stuttering problem and was about to go back to the land where he had killed somebody. My man murked somebody and was like, God, you telling me to go back and tell Pharaoh what? Let my people go. Like he was he didn't feel qualified, but he felt called. And so I want you all to know, like this speaking is a calling. And so whether you're speaking for a church or a ministry or faith based, whether you speak for nonprofit, whether you speak for a women's shelter or a women's organization or a men's group, whether you speak for a school or university, whether you speak for an organization or a company, Fortune 500, wherever you speak, when you have the power to speak life to those individuals. I'm going to be next week speaking for a pharmaceutical company. I sat down and met with them. God already told me what to share with them. I know what the theme is. I know what the purpose for this pharmaceutical company event is. I know about the demographic, the people in the audience. I know all of that. I am still I am still going to go in there and give them the word that God has impressed upon me 
to share with them, right? Because I got to be mindful, okay, God, what are you saying in this due season? Because it's all ministry. That's how I can go into a super, as some would say, secular, super corporate environment and speak. But grown people come to me, grown men in tears saying, I'm going to be a better father because of your speech, because of your presentation. Like, I want to be a better leader, a better husband. Like, I'm trying to go with that type of energy, right? And so I share it with you, like, all speaking is ministry, and you got to just be mindful of that. All right, let's get to some of these questions, and I'm going to get y'all out of here. Um, but let me just say this here. Whatever opportunity you get to speak. Whatever, whatever chance you get, whenever somebody comes to you and gives you a chance to speak, I've had a lot of people, and I'm going to do a live. Y'all fellas, remind me in the next coming weeks, I'm going to do a live just on the importance of speaking for free and the purity of the heart, right? But when you get these opportunities, just know that you have a chance, you have a moment, you have an opportunity to speak life into somebody, to pour into somebody, to love on somebody, to give them enough grit to keep fighting. You don't know what's going on inside their world. You don't know who they just had to bury. You don't know what kind of dark, evil thoughts they've been having. You don't know who's on the verge of the porch or who just got diagnosed with cancer or who feels like they're not good enough or who avoids a mirror because they don't like what they see in return. Like, you don't know who be dealing with what. I mean, you have an opportunity to stand in front of them to speak words that can pierce their hearts and minds. What a high honor that is. So I want you all, as we get ready to transition to questions, I want you all to be mindful of that. It's like, man, every time I got a chance to speak, it's like, okay, God, like, what do you want me to share? What is the message I should be delivering to these people? What level of vulnerability and transparency do I got to have to really connect with them in the best way? All right, let's get these questions going. Next Level Talks, I want y'all now to talk to me, let me know how you feeling. Where's the first question at? Yep, we got it coming up right here. Okay, bet. Yeah, bet. Let's go. Let's go. You see it through my optics. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Um, when you were speaking at the jail, um, how did you make the connection? Oh, bruh. So I'm standing before them now. I, you know, I go in there with some J's or, you know what I'm saying, some sneakers on, some jeans, a hoodie. I just go in there kind of just doing my thing, being myself. But I think the way I made the best connection with them is I was always share my story. So I was standing, when I first stood in front of the guys, I was like, hey, what's up, guys? I was like, yo, I'm an entrepreneur. I own my own company. I'm a motivational speaker. I'm an author. I've written these four books. I've been able to travel all over the world. And half of them was like, okay, that's dope. And half of them was just like, okay, and what that mean for me? And I was just like, but don't get it twisted. I remember I was 16 when I first got arrested. And I began to tell them all the mistakes I made. You know what I'm saying? I began to tell them all the struggles I was having. I began to tell them all the, all the challenges. I was just like, I remember when I, when I was remembering, when I went to a detention center, I remember, you know what I'm saying, stealing cars. I remember selling weed by the pound. Like, I remember pulling kick doors <laughs> through my optics. That's how I built a connection with them. They was like, yo, bro, you a pastor, preacher, motivational speaker, author, husband, father. Did you? Yeah, I used to kick doors. I said, but there's this thing, y'all, in the word of God that says, if any man be in Christ, he'll do creature. I'm not that guy no more, and I'm here to let you know you ain't got to be that. You are not the sum of your mistakes. You are now the sum of the decisions you make for the future you're going to have. I told them that. I, was, I ain't never said that. I think that might have been all right. I was like, hey, you're not the sum of the mistakes you made. You are the sum of the choices that you're about to make in the future. And where you going? Right? You, you have the possibilities, the capabilities to determine your success in the future. And so that's how I built the connection with them, bro. I let them know. I said, hey, bro, man, I used to move work. I used to sell weed by the pound. I said, I never, I never sold. A, I sold a two little quarter ounces, but I never sold like nickel dime quarterback. I said, bro, it was always the whole pound. You know what I'm saying? I pulled kick doors. Like, I, I let them know, like, bro, I lived that lifestyle before because I wasn't living a life of purpose. But now I'm in alignment with God. I'm on something different. And I told him, I gave him my classic line. Your condition is not your conclusion. That's why I came all the way across town. That's why I come up and show up on a regular basis to pour into y'all because I see the greatness that's inside you. Oh, let me tell you something. They looking at me like the hometown hero. And so that's the energy that I had. All right, next question. Appreciate that. Jalil, what's up, fam? Appreciate you, Jay. What do you do to fill your spirit to be of service and uh, um, to pour into others? So, man, for the longest, bro, I was just going off of the early mornings 
with God. There were some seasons when I would wake up at three o'clock. There were some seasons I would wake up at four o'clock. And then there were some seasons where I would sleep in till like five, you know what I'm saying? And I, would, I wouldn't get up until five o'clock. It really just depended on the season I was in, if I was working on a book or if I was in transition or whatever. And so for me, what, what helped me to fill my cup was that time in the morning with God. But one area that I failed at Jalil is that I was not intentional about pouring into myself, you know what I'm saying, and taking like a sabbatical. Because let me tell you something. You, you typically hear... CEOs, regular people, business owners take vacations, but you hear pastors take sabbaticals. And because though I've never pastored the church, I've always been viewed as a shepherd. Ever since I came out that water, I've always been leading a group of people, a flock of people, where there was our young adult and youth outreach team, a group of college students, small groups like an elder, like a pastor, preacher, traveling, speaking. Like I've always had a group of people that followed me. So I've always been in that shepherd style role but I never took a sabbatical, bro. And so now one thing that's critical for me is I'm taking off four weeks at the end of the year, all of December. And really, I was just talking to my wife and we probably gonna do the last two weeks of November too. And we just in South Africa, bro, on the coast. We might spend some time in Ghana, spend some time in Cape Town, you know what I'm saying, on the coast and just rest and recalibrate. Because what I realized in 2022, in 2023, I was running, and I was running hard, but I was running on fumes. I promise you, bro, if I jump in my, if I jump in my um, Yukon, Denali, and I'm driving on the highway, and I, and I got like five miles to the gallon, like four miles, three miles, and then it get to a point where it ain't showing. You ever drove your truck? You, <laughs> Savai, Savai, you know what I'm talking about? You done been there, right? <laughs> oh, for sure. So, so you, there... Just realize that, bro. I, I literally have been one time mashing because I've been so busy. I was like, yo, I need to get some gas. Then I'm like, okay, how much gas I have? I'm like, this is weird. Let me Google this. How come it ain't telling me? I'm like, oh, I ain't, it's telling me I got zero miles. But guess what? I'm still running. But I was running on fumes. And it's only a matter of time before that truck starts putting. And so for me, what I'm doing now is I'm taking more time. Uh, I'm pacing myself. I'm saying no more to some good opportunities because they might not be God opportunities. And I'm really trying to do less and I'm really pouring into those that add the most value to my life. But at the same time, I'm not able to be as accessible as I would do before. And that's what's allowing me to fill my spirit and fill my cup more to give me more capacity to help others. All right, great question, man. Next one, let me get it. Uh, FKG, is it good to ask your audience questions during your presentation? How much is too much? It depends on the crowd, right? Like that crowd that I was with with 200 people because it was like a small ballroom style setting. I could have easily been like, okay, you all tell me, tell me this real quick. Somebody shout out. How, how long you been with the company for? How long you been with the organization? Like what are some of your biggest challenges? That would have been fitting. But if you're in a room of 800 or 18,000 people or 1,200 people, you don't want to be taking questions because it can seem weird. So I would say the smaller the group is, the more intimate and the more interaction. Think of intimacy and interaction, the smaller the group is. And so I could have, for that group, I could have been like, hey, y'all tell me some of the top things you're struggling. I had already knew all the information. So I didn't even have to ask no questions. But then there are some times when they want me to do Q&A, right? I'm speaking for this big pharmaceutical company, hundreds of people, and they said that they want to do Q&A. But I believe that that Q&A will be with the CEO and they will submit their questions before I get there. So it'll be like a fireside chat with me and the CEO. And then he'll ask the questions and I'll answer them there live in front of all of their sales agents. Okay, I hope that was helpful. Let me get that next one. Your cousins, Nordy Hugh, what it do? What are some things to look out for to recognize it's time for that sabbatical? What's up, play cousin, Ken Folk? Nordy Hugh, Lime and Blue 42. <laughs> you know that's Nordy, right? Yeah. yeah, I love it, man. So, um, so I so I think you know. If you feel like you are always great question, when do you know it's time for sabbatical? Um I think when you realize that you tired, when you realize you never took a break for yourself, when you realize that you've been going, 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 when you feel like you were shelling yourself, 
like man in 2022 2023 i was suffering from depression and didn't know it listen to me y'all Nordy, i just felt like i was weird i was just like why do i feel like this why am i in the funk i never used the word depression i was like no that's for other people I'm, I'm, I'm mentally, I'm emotionally strong. I'm spiritually strong. I'm firm in the Lord. I seek his face at four o'clock in the morning. I'm good. I'm just in a weird place. God was like, nah, bro. Counselors was like, nah, bro. You, was, you, you were and you was and you are battling with depression. And so oftentimes, you know you need that sabbatical and you know you need to take a break. And it's different for everybody. Some people go on a sabbatical for two weeks. Some people go on it for a few different months. Right. And so I realized like I had to do a better job of taking care of myself. So to you and everybody else is watching and listening now and you're wondering, like, man, do I need a break? Yes. If you start to feel like you need a break and you look up at this like years and you ain't had a break and you ain't never had no time for yourself, you should do it. Let me tell you something else you should do, Nordy. And this is something I've been doing is I've been I've been having time just to myself up until be, a year ago. Hmm. Excuse me, I never was on that. I hope that mic ain't picked that up. That boy got, <laughs> that boy got them good mics. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Um, but I, I never wanted to take a trip by myself. You know what I'm saying? Dewan, you know what I'm saying? Others in my circle was like, bro, you should just go somewhere and get away. I was like, bro, I don't want to go and get away by myself. Like, I want to go with somebody. You know what I'm saying? But I realized now the importance of going somewhere and just being quiet and not taking no calls. You know what I'm saying? Or even sending your family out. Or you going to a little hotel somewhere and just chilling and watching Netflix. And I'll never forget, um, it was near the end of 2022 uh, when my counselor, one of my counselors, Dr. Mobley, was just like, Jeremy, I'm concerned. She was like, you about to crash and burn. I can hear it in your voice. I can sit in your eyes. I was like, no, nah, I'm just in a weird place. She was like, no, baby, you need to go somewhere. She had auntie vibes. Doc was like, you need to go get you a hotel. Tell Tracy, take care of the kids. You need to get away. She was like, don't be up in there reading the Bible all day, trying to be holy. This ain't the time for that. She's like, you go and watch movies. You order pizza. Don't talk to nobody and just chill. You know what I'm saying? Like, just relax. And so I was just like, okay. And so I don't know how to answer, you know what I'm saying? When does somebody know when they should take a sabbatical? But I think you know when you need a break. Because when you really feel like you were shelling yourself, if you feel like you snappy with your spouse or you snappy with your children and you're not bringing your best and you realize like, man, you ain't got much joy and you finding other ways to measure. Because I got a few friends of mine that's like got some other ways of kind of managing the pain that they're dealing with. And I'm like, yo, that's just masking it. And it's low key making it worse. You got to take a break. And you got to do what you can afford. Some people can afford to leave the country for a month. Some people can afford to leave the state for a week. Some people can just afford to take a few days to themselves, right? And so, but there are some other ways. You can take sabbaticals from social media. Look, y'all, I know people that have been like, man, I've been off social media for a month. I'm like, how you feel? They're like, amazing. I'm like, wow. Because they don't have the pressure of comparing their life to somebody else's life. And even if you're not, noticeably doing it, you just seeing everybody else living their life on the phone, it makes you automatically question the life that you live in. And so there are some people that take a sabbatical from relationships or take a sabbatical from social media. I would just say for you all watching to do the absolute best you can do to take care of yourself. I don't lost too many partners. I don't lost too many friends. Like this, people talking about mental health, that ain't no buzzword. This is something we should have been talking about. And truth be told, depending on who you are and your makeup and your ethnicity, you got some traumas inside you that you was inherited from your from your ancestors and your parents and your great grandparents and your great great grandparents. And that stuff was in their body, those chemicals, those emotions, and that stuff was passed down to you. So some of you all is just tired, but you have the responsibility to value you. Maya Angelou said it best. Maya Angelou said, I don't trust people who don't love themselves. She was like, because how can you? even think to love me if you don't first love yourself. And so you got to ask yourself to everybody watching, right? Like, do I love myself? Am I taking advantage of myself? Am I, am I doing the best I can to put myself in the best position so I can not just be the best person, but I can live the best life? Yep. And that's your responsibility. Let me get another question. <clears throat> ah, <laughs> Overland. What's up, family? Um, how was speaking, uh, how has speaking in the last few months 
drawing you closer to your family and God? How has speaking um, in the last few months drawn you closer to your family and God? You know, honestly, I can't say that speaking over the last few months has necessarily uh, drawn me closer to my family and God because I'm already, you know, really close um, with my family. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, like me and God are, are we, you know, we have we daily. You know, I'm seeking His face. Uh, me and Tracy, marriage counseling, growing, putting in more time, being more present with my kids. If anything, because I'm not traveling as much. Come on, sis, because I'm not traveling as much has created more space for me to be more present with my family and with God. Does that make sense? Because in previous seasons, when I'm jumping on the airplane three times a week, like that's a lot, y'all. That's a lot. But now it's like I'm going to jump on the plane once, maybe twice a week. It's a lot lighter, so I have even more time to be present with my family. And uh, as my boy, Dr. Myron Edmonds, told me years ago, he said, never make your family feel like they're in competition with your ministry. So that was, that was huge for me. All right, let me get two more before we get out of here. Rashawn, lost my job, wifey in a doctoral program, our three young boys and mother-in-law are living with us. Okay, hold on. We're going to just pause right there. Let me just process this. So you lost your job, so you went transition. Your wife is in a doctoral program. Amazing. Your three young boys <clears throat> and your mother-in-law is living with y'all. <clears throat> what practical advice do you have for booking your first engagement quickly for content purposes? Um, that's a loaded question. But let me just first let me just first say this, my brother, um, Rashawn, man, I'm proud of you, bro. I just feel like you need to hear that, man. I am, I, I am proud of you. Just sit in there, brother. I, I, I already know the anxiety that you losing your job has caused you. I already know the frustrations. You didn't say you left your job. You quit. You lost it. They let you go, right? And so I can only imagine the strain, the pressure that's put on you. Having your wife in a doctoral program, I don't know if she's working, but I mean, that alone is like a full-time job. Then you got your three young boys and your mother-in-law living with you. I'm proud of you, King. And I want to just take a moment to salute you, man. Because a lot of times, you know what I'm saying, this, you don't always feel appreciated. You don't always feel seen. You don't always feel heard. You know what I'm saying? And sometimes you might feel like what you're doing is not good enough. And I want to just salute you and shout you out, man. If, it, if it's any other powerful men of God, man, that want to just love on um, Rashawn in the chat and just give him some words of encouragement in the chat. Let him know this thing is real. Like, bro, that's a lot that you got going on being in between jobs. You sound like you want to work and you want to go get it. So I love it. <clears throat> this is what I would recommend for you to do. For one, I would recommend, I would not, I, I, I want you to pursue speaking, but I want you to make it a full-time job looking for a full-time job. Hear me, hear me, bro. Make it a full-time job looking for a full-time job. It is a lot easier for you to get out here and get engagements and opportunities to speak and begin to grow your branding and logos and web kites, websites and EPKs and speaker reels and all of that stuff when you got constant money coming in. Your first priority is to take care of your beautiful wife, your three young beautiful boys and your beautiful mother-in-law. That is your first priority. The speaking part going to come. And I'm believing that in the next 12 months, in the name of Jesus, that whatever job you in now, you're going to be able to transition back to speaking. And I know you probably feel like, man, Jay, but I lost my job. This was a sign from God. I got to go get it. Like, I hear you. I hear you loud and clear. But I will also say this here. Your first priority is to take care of your family. So I would say to work on getting that, get, you know what I'm saying, get, look, look for that job, make it a full-time job, to find a full-time job as you build your speaking business, right? Because your first um, your first engagement quickly, I wouldn't even say do it for content purposes because your first engagement, it might not even be content worthy. I would say just get your foot out in the, through the door, get as many opportunities as possible, add as much value, speak as much as you can, bless as many people, really learn the art of speaking, your story and your message, 
and really connecting with the people and watch the opportunities come your way. And then when you have the resources, you want to get that logo, you want to get the EPK done, then you want to get that website done. You can wait a while on the speaker reel. Right. And then the website, you can get some professional lifestyle photos taken. You might not have no crazy photos with you on stage, but you want to have a clean one page website where they can scroll to see a nice, clean, modern website. And it's clear what it is you're about. Remember, when you're building out the copy, the language for your website, if you confuse me, you'll lose me. But if you compel me, you'll sell me. So you want to make sure that you're very, um, very clear and concise with who you are, what you stand for, what your message is about, and the value that you can bring to that individual, um, to that industry, or to that audience, and then begin to build your speaking career from there, my brother. Great question, man. Let me get one more, guys, and we're going to call it a night. Martez, what's up, family? Question, starting off as a novice speaker, how do you determine what is a God opportunity versus a good opportunity? So I would say, man, as, as you're starting off, novice speaker or not, right? If you got an opportunity to speak life, bro, take it. So I'm, let me tell you something. Take it. If you got an opportunity to speak life, take it. I don't care if the next six engagements over the next two months, they like, hey, we would love for you to come here and speak, but we don't have no budget. I would not tell you to turn that down. You know why? Because you can't be God-given. You can't be God-given. So I would say take every single opportunity that comes your way when it comes to you speaking and taking a stage. That's what I would say. The next thing I'll say is as you're speaking and as you're growing your brand, you're going to see more and more opportunities come your way. So I'm not, I don't look at gigs and say, is this a good opportunity or is it a God opportunity? I look more like business decisions like that. I know every time they put a microphone in my hand, it's an opportunity for me to minister. It's a God opportunity. Right. I've noticed that every time. But I am being more selective now, especially with my free engagements, because it's like, OK, now you caused me to leave my family. Now you ask me to come to Minneapolis or in a smaller town in Minnesota and you want me to speak at eight o'clock in the morning and you ask me to come for free. OK, now you tripping because now I got to leave my family. I got to spend a night in a hotel somewhere. Then I got to drive an hour and a half to your town to speak for free. Like, that's a lot. You can find a local joker for that. You know what I'm saying? I'm just being honest with y'all. But if it's local and I can easily pull up, cool. Again, Martez, I told the people last week, and I'll tell you every week, you don't pay me for my message. You pay me to leave my family. I'm much more inclined to take a free speaking engagement when it's right here in Atlanta. But to jump on an airplane and travel all the way to the West Coast to speak for an hour and then fly all the way back, and I got to pay for the flight, I got to pay for the whole, right, that's, that's the stretch. I speak all day and night right here in the city of Atlanta or within driving distance. I hope that was helpful. So every opportunity that comes your way where you can speak and it's not putting you out, you know what I'm saying? I feel like you should take it. Are there times when you should pay to get to certain conferences to have a booth and invest in your business? Absolutely. Right? But I tell people all the time, like, man, you sold those seeds. Give, Martez. You know the word God, and it shall be given back to you. Press down, shaking together, running over. You just keep giving. You just keep serving. You just keep pouring into the people. But at the same time, you're building out your brand. You're building out your infrastructure. You're capturing those high quality photos. And we'll talk about that in a few weeks of what to do and how to maximize those free opportunities. But you build your brand so that they come to you with budgets, right? So that they come to you. I've had organizations all the time start off with Ebony. And I only got 7,500. By the time they, she done with it, they got 35,000. I'm like, that's hilarious. I only had this much, right? Like, there's a science to this thing. But I would say for all of you all that's speaking and just starting out and you want to make an impact, you want to make a difference, you want to get as many opportunities as possible, man, bless and speak to as many people as possible. You know what I'm saying? Because you cannot be God-given. And it's going to always come back. I remember one time, and I'm going to say this before I pray and close this out. <clears throat> I remember one time... I was doing a training online. I think it was like a three-day challenge. I was talking to ET. And uh, I was just like, man, E, I looked at it. And I was like, if I look at the percentage from 100% of every single time I've spoken over the last 14, 15 years, if I look at every single time I spoke, how many times was paid and how many times was free, I said, man, big bro, I'm probably at 40%. I'm probably at 40% of my speaking engagements have been free. And I've only been paid for 60% over a 14-year span. You know what ET 
he told me his numbers was. Y'all tell me in the chat what y'all think. E.T., the number one motivational speaker in the world. Tell, and I want you, Stavon, to tell me what, they, what numbers they're saying. What percentage would you say that E.T. was speaking? What percentage was his speaking engagements free in his 30-year run? Because he's been speaking for 30 years now. What they saying? They're saying 90%. Somebody said 70, 30. Another person just said 70, 30. 60%, 50%, 35%. Very good. Man. 70%. So imagine, E.T., the number one motivational speaker in the world. 70% of his speaking engagements over his career of 30 years have been for free. That means he's spoken way more for free. So for those of y'all that's like, man, how do I get to that next level? Man, just keep blessing. Just keep pouring in these people, but build your business, your marketing, your branding all at the same time, right? Because though this is ministry, like you should still be compensated. And I'm believing that you're going to be compensated very well. And I believe as you invest into your business, other people will be able to notice it and they will feel like you're a worthy investment. And it's only a matter of time before they pay you what you deserve. Man, God, we're grateful to have this time to chop it up tonight. Um, we're grateful for the reminder um, that all speaking is ministry. I pray for those that's on with me right now, that's watching the recording, that's in a weird place, that's looking for speaking engagements, they're looking for free opportunities. I pray for those that's getting free opportunities because they're looking to get past free opportunities. I pray for those who are looking to just get started. I pray for those that might be between jobs. I pray for those that's like, okay, I got a message, I got a story, but I'm not really sure what angle, what approach to take. I, I just feel the weight and the heaviness of those watching this that's tapped in right now. Um, and folks are tired. You know what I'm saying? Like, folks need sabbatical. Folks need to hit their reset. And so I pray that you will give them creative ways to take care of themselves, to prioritize their peace, to take a break. It might be as simple as them cutting their phone on Do Not Disturb, getting the family situated, lighting a candle, cut some jazz music on, and soak in the hot tub, Lord. Like, whatever it is that they got to do to just help recalibrate their mind, their brain, day in and day out, and stop the noise in the club. And, Lord, take care of our minds, God. Take care of our families. Take care of our relationships. Take care of our jobs, our business ventures. Uh, take care of our future, God. Uh, and I pray that as we as we trust you will take care of that, I pray, God, that you will take care of us. Yeah, that you will take care of us and that we would do a better job of taking care of ourselves so that we can speak, we can lead, we can guide, we can minister from a pure place and really go about changing lives and make an impact out here in the world. That's my prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Man, man, thank y'all for tapping in with me tonight put a man in the chat put a man in the chat hey before you go um guys we got any announcements anything i need to share with the squad oh yeah 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 the comment yeah the con how could i forget we got the video y'all want to see the y'all just put movie in the chat if you want to see this video for the conference that we have coming up june 7th to 9th here in Atlanta, Georgia, just put movie, put movie, put movie in the chat. Are they putting it? Yes, sir. All right, all right, Jerry, roll that, roll that beautiful video footage. This is only day one, and I'm losing my mind because I'm already changed. Incredible, and so many connections. It's crazy. I came to take my speaking to the next level. They took my life to the next level. Ain't no competition when you make it to the top. More family time, more abundance, you've been made for more. Either you're in the midst of adversity, just came out of adversity, or you're about to head into some adversity. So you better be prepared for it either way. Don't miss it because it's life changing. Listen, listen to me, man. Um, it is going to be a vibe. I literally have somebody hit my phone every day like, bro, are the tickets still on sale? When is early burnt in? What day you speaking on? I'm like, what day am I speaking on? I'm speaking at least twice a day. You know what I'm saying? This my sucker. You know what I'm saying? E.T. going to be there. Inky going to be there. We got like eight or nine dynamic, powerful women speakers that's going to be there. It's over 23 speakers 
at this three-day conference, y'all. It is going to be crazy. Y'all, we haven't even rolled out the names of who all going to be there, but just know it's going to be special, man. So we're looking forward to that. So all of y'all, put it on Stavon. You shaking your head, Stavon? Stavon, no. It is going to be cray-cray. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So yeah, man, Next Level um, Speakers Conference.com. If you're interested, check it out. And um, you think these lives are something, you think my training is something, um, you think our masterminds are something, man, there's nothing like our conference. It is the homecoming. It is like the Super Bowl of the Next Level Speakers Academy. It's a music. It's a movie. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. I got a free training this Sunday. So for those of you all that's interested in tapping in, uh, where do they go? I guess go to my end. Yeah. Yeah, it's a link in the comments. So nlsaworkshop.com. I do have a free two-hour training if y'all want to tap in and get some more game um, this weekend. And um, besides that, y'all, um, I'm out, man. Thank y'all for tapping in. Share this with somebody that you believe wants to be a speaker or that is a speaker or that's interested in living a life of purpose. Man, share this with them. Thank y'all for tapping in. I won't be with y'all. Wait, will I be with y'all next week? The week after next, because we got a mastermind at Cancun, and I got that speaking engagement that's actually on Wednesday. So I won't be there, but I'll see y'all in two weeks. Let's get it.